Okay, thank you very much, Bruce, uh, on that. It's quite a complicated topic. Well, quite simple in a way, but you know, relatively complicated in other ways, perhaps. But everybody has to be prepared for it. I think that's the message. Uh, what we're going to discuss now in the panel is um, whether regulations and sanctions work in terms of policing the performance of shipping. Uh, we have as our moderator Richard Fulford Smith, managing director of Affinity, and on the panel. We have Richard Mead, Editor-in-Chief at Lloyd's List, uh, Morton Arnson, Executive Chairman, Team Tankers International, Russell Hoare, who's partner with, of the CM, CMS Antitrust Competition and Trade Team of CMS here in the UK, and Frank Dunn, a former senior partner at WFW and currently an independent consultant. Uh, Richard, please. Does this work? Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Um, first of all, thanks very much indeed to Bruce for actually clarifying uh, in a quite detailed fashion what I'm going to turn over to my panel, which consists of actually to my immediate right, uh, Russell Hoare, who I'll start with. Um, sorry, not you. <laughs> uh, Richard Mead, obviously editor-in-chief of Lloyd's List. Morton Arnson, uh, chairman of Team Tankers International, and I think also working for a certain Australian banking organisation, quite no well known to most of us, Macquarie. And of course, the inevitable presence of our seasoned lawyer, Mr. Frank Dunn, um, now uh, operating as an independent consultant. So first of all, I'm promising that I will speak now for one minute only because I've asked all my panelists if they can restrict themselves as far as possible to fairly quick fire responses to what are pretty straightforward questions. On a, on a topic which is not easy, and Martin Stockford was helpfully reminding uh, both he and I that we were starting in 1973 to look at shipping, which is an alarming 50 years plus ago now. So there we go, and it's fair to say that we've come a long way, but here we are back with a similar sort of scenario relating to a war which we need to obviously pay close attention to. It doesn't look like this thing's going away anytime soon, and we're sorry about that. But first of all, let me say congratulations to Igor Sechin. Igor Sechin is the chief executive of Rosneft. I would suggest that he probably understands shipping, and he probably understands the relevance of oil better than any other politician that you would care to spend any time with. Needless to say, we don't spare time with him because I would have difficulty with that. But it is quite staggering how little shipping um, occurs on, you know, basically appears on the radar of most people who are outside our industry. We ship, as we all know, 90% of global goods, and it's really important that we do it in the, po the most safe manner. Operating ships in the Dart Fleet is not safe. I will come to Richard on that as a closing uh, comment later. But anyway, um, I'm pretty sure that Eagle would be scoffing at our session. I can't imagine that he'd be too worried by the threat of any OFAC action because he's got a number of people who've been referred to already. And now I'm going to suggest to you that that war machine, which he's continuing to fund, is pretty damned effective. Um, the numbers you've seen from a number of different people, but I'll let my panel take it. So let me, without further ado, pass you over to Russell, who is a partner of CMS, specializes in antitrust competition and trade. Thank you very much, Richard. That's great. I think your first question you were going to put to me was um, you were asking, um, wondering whether the um, sanctions legislation by OFAC and the other global sanctions regulators were perhaps window dressing in the current environment. Um, they were maybe not as effective as they're claiming to be. And obviously, Bruce's presentation was very illuminating, certainly showed that um, OFAC has um, made a lot of strides in the last year. I think my, my experience is more on the European angle, and I think it is fair to say that in Europe, the sanctions regulators have felt a little bit less relevant um, in recent months. And I, I think partially that is because that um, um, sanctions regulators are used to um, dealing um, with um, quite... Um, industries where they put ambiguous legislation in place and industries tend to move to over comply because there's a lot of political rhetoric, a lot of political pressure to comply and firms think, well, I don't want to be seen to be dealing with Russia too much. 
that's going to be a reputational harm in addition to not completely understanding the sanctions position. So um, the UK, UK regulator, the EU regulators are used to over compliance and people really moving out of Russian dealings. And for various reasons, of course, that hasn't really happened in the shipping sector in quite the same way as we see in other industries. And I think that there's a few reasons for that, of course. And it's really because of the delicate balancing of the geopolitical issues that, that we see. Um, obviously, we've had withholding of uh, services entirely it means that um, vulnerable jurisdictions kind of face price rises. As we saw with uh, the Ukrainian um, blockade, I mean, the price of gain surged. We don't want that in oil. I would also sort of perhaps confuse rhetoric. The EU level, uh, Ursula von der Leyen at the European Commission has talked tough, but we haven't necessarily seen as much toughness from the national uh, sanctions regulators who are actually expected to implement EU sanctions regulations. Um, and also, of course, there's a balance between efficiency, keeping business moving, and trying to actually implement tough sanctions. So, for example, KYC, how long is a piece of string? Well, if one to really take KYC to the nth degree, you could be going on for days, going backwards and forwards, putting additional questions to your counterparts. So, of course, what the regulators have tried to do is go for the attestations route, the idea being that it's something that's quick and easy, can be done fast, but, of course, that does mean that it may catch the most egregious breaches, but as we're seeing, quite a lot is slipping through. So I don't think it's cynical by design. Um, it's not intended to fail, but of course there are structural issues in, in trying to manage that. Thanks, Thanks very much. Um, Richard, um, well, you've obviously heard already that there's somewhere between 800 and 1,600. Actually, your own Michelle said there was 80 million tons of capacity in the hands of people who operate the Star Fleet. Uh, 560 tankers she'd counted. I'd like to ask you whether you have any sort of breakdown of that. And the other question I had for you was, you know, we hear a lot and we've seen in the press people, Fractal, Hennessy, Gatti, Radiating World and all sorts of weird names. I mean, we'd, we'd like to know a little bit more about whether you've got data on that as well. We do indeed. Um, I think it's worth pointing out that, you know, depending on how you define the Dark Fleet, uh, is going to skew the numbers slightly. I, I'm going to be spewing some uh, detailed numbers at you in just a second, and they are calculated by the lovely lady over there, Michelle Vizzi Botton, our principal analyst. So she is very much the person you need to buy a drink afterwards if you want some proper detail and uh, proper gossip on this. But, uh, you know, we are looking at this as about 12% of the internationally trading fleet uh, being in the dark fleet, and they are the ones that are carrying sanctioned trade, Venezuela, Iran, and obviously Russia. Um, I can give you the breakdown in terms of the actual types of BLs and Suez and all the rest of it, but actually, I think the more interesting breakdown is where and how they are operating. And, you know, I think we need to look at where these things are being registered, where they are being managed from, where they are being flagged, and the structures that we are building in this room that allow these ships to actually continue to flow. Marshall Islands, 36% of registered owners are there, followed by Hong Kong, followed by Seychelles, Liberia, and then, of course, our old friend, opaque Panama. 28% uh, managed out of China and Hong Kong, 19 out of India, closely followed by Putin's favorite laundromat, Dubai. Um, we have 51% uh, of the Dark Fleet flagged in Panama. Um, a special mention, of course, to Gabon, uh, who, despite going through a coup, um, have managed to, managed to increase the size of their fleet by several hundred percent, taking in Dark Fleet um, since they set up in the wake of sanctions. They are very much viewing this as a business model. Um, uh, keep your eyes peeled on Lloyd's List tomorrow for uh, news of another centrally uh, landlocked African state who is um, obviously following suit and decided that this is very much a business model. While other flags, of course, have decided to expunge this, um, certain other flags have decided to take these as a shopping list of things they want to take on. Um, so I would say that, you know, when you start looking at the numbers, the point that I'm trying to make is it's not just about these opaque structures and those ones that you've mentioned, they are fragmenting, they are dissipating, the rats are running underneath the rocks and uh, are finding new places to hide, but they are evolving and they are growing. Thank you, and you know, I think there's very little doubt in this room that it's perfectly obvious that if people ask the right questions, you will get answers. If OFAC actually really wanted to know more about the way shipping operates, Michelle, you've got the list. Richard, you've identified it brilliantly. Frank, I'm going to turn to you because, of course, what we do know is that an enormous amount of ships found their way into this dark fleet because people were tempted to sell to them. Well, guess what? 
they were tempted to sell because they were offering extremely decent pricing. So we have a process that uh, I've talked about on many t um, times before, but I wanted, Frank, just what you think should be the right KYC process so that you can identify with who you're selling to. And should we know who lies behind these single purpose companies, which are obviously not likely to appear on a sanctions check? Let's get real. I think I said to somebody who asked me the question, what do you mean? I said, well, they were probably actually, uh, they were probably actually handled by the same lawyer who holds the escrow account, and this is the process they go through. Guess what? You're not going to find out. It'll be too late. The ship's gone. She'll end up in Gabon before you know it. So, Frank, can you just talk us through what you think should be the process? Well, I think the key is that um, this kind of conference has, or your, some of your introduction uh, has suggested that there is a culture of some kind of non-compliance in the maritime sector in relation to sanctions. And I think that's wholly misconceived, certainly so far as law firms, brokers, underwriters in the UK and in Europe are concerned. I think they are extremely diligent. Any one of you who have tried to do any banking transactions or insurance transactions in recent times will have found an intense focus on compliance with the AML requirements. And I think, I mean, I myself had a recent example where I was uh, doing a banking transaction and I was asked whether I was the Frank Dunn from Liverpool who had recently been convicted of armed robbery. And I was pleased to tell them that it wasn't me. Um, but they didn't proceed to ask whether I was intending to follow the career of my namesake up in Liverpool because that isn't part of the AML test. And I think the key here is that I think in the UK, Europe generally, you have very good compliance with the AML questions. And people try very, very hard to get to the bottom of what they're supposed to get to the bottom of in relation to uh, money laundering, knowing your customer, knowing what your customer intends to do. But there is no requirement in relation to sanctions for an owner to speculate as to whether or not the vessel that is being sold is intended for a good purpose or a bad purpose. And actually, as we've heard from uh, Bruce earlier, the sanctions are very subtle, nuanced, and you know, quite challenging to understand because this is not a sanction against Russian oil. As we've heard, Russian oil is flowing freely and people want it to flow freely because without the Russian oil flowing, the wheels of the Western economies might fall off. So they want the oil to flow, but what they don't want is for Russia to profit over a certain level from receiving that oil. Now that is a really difficult concept to try and impose willy-nilly. And certainly the tool of uh, compliance in terms of know your customer AML is not the method to do that. We have in shipping an example, something similar. In relation to the uh, Hong Kong Convention with respect to scrapping of vessels, we do ask owners to look forward and say, uh, what is this vessel going to be used for? Are you circumventing sustainable recycling by the sale that you are, uh, you, are, you are doing? So it's perfectly possible for the regulators, if they want to impose that kind of regulation, to do so, but currently they do not. So I think that's uh, the sort of canard out here, and I, I'm, I'm very unfond of the um, Star Wars terminology of dark fleet and all this kind of stuff, because I think it just distracts from the substance. The substance is that there is a series of regulations which for the most part is complied with by European people who are under the compliance regimes. And the um, need is for a, if the regulators wish to make a more uh, imposing sanctions regime against Russia in terms of interdicting the transport of oil or making the pr price cap more effective, they have the tools to do so. And uh, you know, they, they just have to get on and do it if that's what they want to do. But one has to understand that the sanctions have, uh, are a compromise arrangement between various jurisdictions, which have resulted in less than perfect and less than easy regulation. The old days when you just said, well, you can't trade with Cuba, boys, otherwise we'll blow you out of the water. Those are gone, those are gone. And with Russia, you can't have that kind of approach either because we need the oil. 
Thank you, Frank. Um, did you want to just say something? I'm going to come to you, Morton, because I think you might have something to say about what Frank has said, who's thrown a little bit of a rock in a pool there in my head, which is great, because indeed the majority of buyers identify themselves as being from actually the United Arab Emirates when they approach and the majority of them offer you an awful lot of money, and there are ways that you can actually identify where you're likely to run into difficulty. I regret that we're not dealing, which is a city where I started my shipping career in Liverpool. We don't seem to be dealing with people in Liverpool, and we are trying to actually form a bridge between what's supposed to happen in a NATO country and what apparently is now happening to enable these sales to take place mostly in Dubai. Did you want to say something before I go to Morton? Because I've Just got a very uh, small point on, on, on exactly that. I think it's interesting you use the ship scrapping analogy because we all know that, you know, in terms of where you sell your ship, the fact that you sell it to a legitimate owner but it then disappears into a flag that's almost exclusively designated as a ship scrapping flag in order so it can change hands three times and give you an air gap between it then hitting the beaches, I think is precisely the example we should be given because it may be the fact that the 12 package of European sanctions require you to disclose the names in terms of who you are selling it to. Are we confident that we are going to see said Greek ship owners fully disclosed? I'm not. Are we confident that we're actually going to see where they end up? Probably not. The fact that it's retrospective is very interesting because it does seem that the Europeans are at least trying to build up a case in terms of where these have gone. But we know full well where they've come from. They've come from Europe and they've been sold into the dark fleet. Is anybody going to do anything about it? I don't know. We will see. We somewhat doubt it, but Morton, indeed, you have operated as a ship owner. You face exactly what I just talked about and what you heard Richard talk about. So I would ask the question. If we apply the same rules on actually people who are looking to acquire a ship from you, and then we look at people selling ships out of the Dark Fleet, which is now what's been announced by one of the uh, headlines of the last week, that they're going to start selling these ships. Uh, I mean, I guess that we probably aren't going to be able to deal with those ships as one of the comment, uh, commentators earlier uh, uh, talked about. So would you like to just talk to me about what you think you would be required of you when buying or, and when selling a ship? But first of all, selling a ship. Yeah, I mean, let me uh, preface it that I've been involved with companies that were either public, that will want to access the public markets in the future, or they're controlled by private equity funds, and the private equity funds raise money from institutional investors and such, and, and they want them to ha have the ability to continue to do that. So uh, shipping companies have to be in compliance with the law, and I doubt any will get in trouble for having bad attestations about the price of oil. But that isn't the way the game is played. If the DOJ decides they want to make example, a, a private company that is in dark fleet that's never going to trade the US today, that's a little, that's a warning. When they go into public company, they don't, they're not looking for the attestations. They're going to subpoena all your emails from your top 20 guys for the last 24 months. And they're going to look for one or two where somebody says something like, well, we sold that ship to a single purpose company in Dubai. I, well, we don't really know the owner, but I'm sure it's, it's a good one. They're, they're looking for those comments where your due diligence is a little bit uh, not consistent with the other process. We sold 10 ships to Torm, for example, 10 MRs. Very easy, public company. We know where they trade them. We know what they do. We sold uh, 39 other ships, none to single purpose companies in Dubai. But once they catch that one with the two or three emails, um, I went through a magic pipe DOJ investigation. They went through 36,000 emails of the company. They found one bad one with a comment like that. And that one bad one was enough to hang the company. And the Hennessy, uh, to me, the Hennessy is a shot over the bow to the public companies and the private equity control companies. They're going to come, and you better have your act in order, and you better be having these compliance programs we're recommending. You yeah, thank you. You, you know that 50% of the Hennessy tankers fleet is still moving after that act. I, I think I mean if just you're just going to be doing dark business, and you're never going to be... fuel bill. Somebody is supporting that fleet. So um, generally speaking, people who advertise to sell a ship used to basically invite people to offer. China Ocean Shipping Company happens to be one of the biggest ship owners in the world. China, it's China and 
everything goes in China. Well, I'll tell you what, they've got a pretty robust KYC process. I'm not going to take up too much time, but I can read it to you. And it asks questions of, for example, identifying the source of funds. So, Frank, I have a bit of a problem with the single-purpose company line, but I take your points, um, obviously, about the price cap, and that's well, another subject altogether. Well, I think if you, if you together, think about the comes. process, there are quite a lot of checks and balances mostly in place when dealing with or dealing from a European institution. You have the person who is establishing the escrow account, generally a regulated law firm, Lawyers like myself are absolutely terrified of being on the wrong side of sanctions, and the over-compliance that has been mentioned is something that we are definitely guilty of. We, w we don't want to be uh, accused of being in Frank, I promise you I wouldn't have ever accused you of doing such a thing, but I can tell Se you secondly, that when we, when we transact trans business, money hold on a second, Frank, the when the we transact trans business in Dubai, it is quite irritating that there are two lawyers that are acting on a regular basis. Everybody knows who they are in our business. I'm sorry to say it, we live in a, an, we live in a, a, a system which is very open amongst each other. By the way, you don't get too many people want to talk about it. Well, there's a reason they don't want to talk about it. And it's pretty obvious, I hope, to the audience why we actually quite like to talk about it because we think these are well-intentioned sanctions that have been introduced and we think that people go out of their way to circumvent it. But let's move on, uh, Frank, because I do think it's important that people read what Costco say. And I promise you, if they, follow, if they follow the lead of Costco, we would stop anybody being able to buy a ship in the dark fleet. It's excellent, but I'll show it to you later. Sorry, so I think I should turn back to Russell at some stage. But Morton, thank you for your robust response. Just before I move away from you, Macquarie. I mean, Macquarie Bank would tell you exactly, I'm sure, if you ask them, they would expect you to do in terms of selling uh, one of your assets? Well, I mean, the, the, the regulated banks spend 5% of their expenses now on compliance. Uh, and if you look at the KYC uh, process for Macquarie, it's the Costco one, I think, is robust. Macquarie's is multiple pages of that. But it's not just asking the questions. The file, they have people, they want the documentation. No relationship, no money is forthcoming until all those documents are in. It's a very robust process, and they can, aff they can afford to do it. Um, uh, uh, just the, uh, I read the Costco one. I, uh, we've done a lot of business with Ridgebury Tankers, which has sold 85 tankers the last 10 years, I think. And they asked four simple questions, so I'm stealing from Ridgebury here. And that is, you know, uh, where's the company who owns it? Uh, where'd they get their money? Why are they buying the ship and what are they going to do with it? And when you dig into those, uh, you won't be selling ships to single-purpose companies that were just set up to buy one Russian ship to another. Thank you. Frank, did you want to say anything more on this subject? Or? Well, I think that the compliance regime, certainly in the UK, UK regulated environment, is very brutal. Yeah, we agree. Yeah. And I think you have several cross-checks. Usually there's a bank involved in the transfer of the money. Usually there is a law firm involved in the transaction. They all exercise their due diligence to make sure that the transactions are robust. The question is how you uh, impose upon those people this extra layer of a, of a judgment call. Do I know whether this party, this counterparty I'm dealing with, has the potential to do something that might be lawful or unlawful? And how do I judge that that person might be, have the potential to do something unlawful? It's a very, very difficult judgment. And I think that all of the tests that, uh, that Bruce very kindly set out there um, will be compliant with without you necessarily being able to distinguish between those two types of operations. Yeah, I think that's very fair. Um, just to say, I think I know almost immediately when somebody registers an interest in the ship, whether it's something I should be looking at very closely. Um, just to say that I think the rules that we apply seem to be different to most, and I'm sorry to say it, I agree with Frank that there is a very robust system here in the UK for looking after these things. I suspect that the days of ships being bought through London brokers is probably in the past. I'd like to think it's in the past, because if they end up in the dark fleet, they should be answerable for it. But let me just turn to Richard before we go that, because it's quite difficult to know how you're going to deal with these ships in the dark fleet. As you said earlier, they're changing registry all the time. They end up in Gabon or somewhere like that. Um, 
how do, you, how do you, you expect people to be able to stop these ships training? Because what we'd all like to see is these decrepit old wrecks, which is what half of them are, stopped in their tracks. And do we actually think that Port State Control is ever going to act on behalf of OFAC, for example? to actually prevent a ship from trading? Do you, I mean, listen, the ships go through the Suez Canal. We've talked a lot about the Suez Canal. These ships are actually going through that waterway. They do ship to ship, basically, operations. There was one featured in our lovely Bloomberg <laughs> thing just off Greece. It seems to have disappeared, by the way. I'm not surprised because I think giving publicity to these things has really helped us to try to inhibit the attempts of that dark fleet to deliver the profits that clearly Around, you know, have, have been added up to be over $225 billion in one year of oil money available to arm Mr. Putin's war. That's a pretty frightening number. You can do a lot of damage with that, I think. So, Richard, what do you think about, I mean, how do we help these guys to actually be restricted? I mean, can Hennessy ships all be arrested? What, can, can they be seized? Can we, can we actually enforce a sale that will be handled to pass the proceeds to the Ukrainian war effort? I mean, what do we, what do, we do next? I think there's a couple of points to make here. Uh, one is the basic transparency and the fact that we're actually now, I think, focusing on this properly. I think there has been a tendency within the shipping industry to skirt over this, to, you know, assume that somebody else is dealing with this. It is now getting the visibility, I think. And, you know, the basic act of actually writing about this, which is why we are looking at this, because we think there is a risk involved for the industry, I think that is helping. Um, you know, being put on uh, what is euphemistically referred to in the Lloyd's editorial team as uh, Michelle's naughty list is, um, is, pretty, uh, is pretty frightening for most people. Nobody wants Susie Boxman after them. Um, the, the, the point that I'm making is that I think most people now know where this is going. We are not applying particularly complex analysis to this. We are using IS, we are using our institutional knowledge, and we are looking at this. But I would be flabbergasted if uh, the people within OFAC, within OFSI, within the EU departments are not looking at the same numbers I am. In fact, I know they're not because they're looking at our numbers and they're looking at various other things. They know where this is happening. Now, the appetite for them to enforce that, that's the question, and where. And, you know, you made the point earlier that, you know, th there has been a limited appetite. Twelve packages in from the EU, and by the way, we're still waiting on the FAQ from the last lot, we still haven't seen any real enforcement from the EU. We've seen some lip service pay from OFAC, I would argue, but we haven't seen any real action. And to Bruce's point, in terms of that hierarchy of where you end up, if they really wanted to actually start doing this, secondary sanctions and uh, you know, effectively locking out 12% of the trading fleet of tankers from the US financial system, which, as we all know, operates in petrodollars, that's a fairly effective route to get a good chunk of this moving. So, uh, you know, I d we are not doing everything we need to do to stop it precisely because of the points that we've made. This is a contradictory and slightly ambiguous point of uh, yeah. regulation precisely because we need the oil to keep moving. So we are, to some extent, paying lip service to the fact that we say we want to stop it, but we don't really want to stop it. So, Russell, it was one of the questions that I, uh, I was going to ask you at WND was, you know, whether it's the European Union or whether it's OFAC. Um, what's your view on how we would really go about accelerating this process, how, how we can actually just stop these boats in their tracks. What sort of enforcements can people also accept going forward to prevent it ever happening again? Because it's obscene. And, you know, to my original point, Sechin's actually read the book. He's, he's read it very well. He knew exactly what he was doing. And he knew that he could find people. Greed motivates people to do some pretty stupid things, let's face it. Hmm? So... Yeah, I think, I think actually, I as Richard was saying, really, we're sort of partway through a process here, actually. I think my view is, although we haven't seen much enforcement in Europe and the UK to date, that doesn't mean that perhaps enforcement is being planned behind the scenes. Now, we, we've seen some stats uh, booted around that um, the UK regulator, OFSI, has boosted their staff numbers, I think, from 40 to 140, and they've got a shipping task force. I suspect there is, there is work going on at EU level. Probably the Commission, I suspect, is pointing out targets, particular national sanctions authorities they might want to have a look at. Et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's a bit of a time lag going on here. We've obviously seen o OFAC move very decisively this year, and that's had some traction. But you know, there are people thinking, well, that's all the way over there in the US. That doesn't apply to me. So I think until we start seeing sort of a global enforcement environment really starting to build up, um, that's really going to get momentum. And I suppose an analogy I used the other day um, was almost sort of, well, you, you know, I take the point, Frank, that there are many, many people who are complying, but to the extent there is a sort of a 
a grouping of people who think this doesn't happen to happen to them yet and it doesn't apply. It's almost like a herd of wildebeest running around and they think, well, I've, I'm sa I've got safety in numbers here. I can carry on as I am for a little bit longer, but maybe if one of those few of those wildebeest are brought down by the lions around the edge of the group, suddenly everyone else will, will stop running and, and start to fall into line. So I think, you know, I, I think we're in a bit of a process at the moment. And um, so, you know, there's no magic. The, the rules are out there, and you know, the deliberate ambiguity, as Frank has talked about, is necessary in, s in the regulator's eyes to, to drive compliance in full compliance. But it's just an information piece now, really. People need to realise that, um, you know. That they will be detected, they will be enforced, and um, it could happen to them, and therefore they may need to fall into line. Okay, I, I think there are some, five unintended, warning, so some unintended consequences of the re regime are very, very negative and need to be addressed by the industry. People tr switching off their transponders is something that is extremely serious and potentially dangerous and all that kind of stuff. People lying to their insurance companies about whether they are complying with the, sp the, the price cap or not is a terribly serious matter because it may have the result that if there were to be a casualty in relation to a particular ship where, that, where it was carrying a cargo that was unlawful, that ship might not be insured. I mean, these things are very serious and the proliferation of STS, uh, uh, yes, ship, ship transfer, is something that I think should cause concern, especially from an environmental perspective. So these are sort of, sort of unintended consequences of the regime that the, the shipping industry should take very seriously and should address in a very uh, dynamic way if they want not, not, and it's not about enforcing the sanctions, it's making the industry safe and secure and uh, properly regulated. Thank you. Morton. Um, before I move back to Richard to talk about the transponder issue and safety, because health and safety is, after all, threatened by the continuing existence of this dark fleet, which we know uh, is, a, is, a, is a hazard to other people who are legally uh, trying to uh, ply their trade in international waterways. But, Morton, did, did you want to have a, a closing remark on what Frank and uh, Russell have talked about here in terms of how do we stop these people? I think the, uh, I'll go back to the magic pipe enforcement that the DOJ, that Washington decided they were gonna go after companies for putting brown water overboard illegally. And they would arrest ships and they'd put the crew in hotels in Houston, really bad hotels with bad food, for a year and plus. Uh, and they would make, they would ask for thousands and thousands of documents. Th they're gonna be, the, the, the shot's been fired. One big public company or a company backed by private equity is going to get this, and and there's going to be you know consequences to pay for that. And I think that's the way they're going to get at it. Uh, the, you know, you have to be in compliance with the law. You have to be in compliance with the spirit of the law, um, and you have to anticipate that they are going to, if they're going to ratchet these. In, if this war continues, which I think a lot of people think it will, that they're going to be making examples of some big. Company scalps and fines. That's what the DOJ wants. And a bigger scalp and a more public scalp, yeah. it works. And that'll change our behavior. Yeah, uh, I think we all agree with that. I think, um, just like to say before I pass to Richard to close on health and safety, just to say that I think that these debates are actually very helpful. I would like them to be public because I think they need to be public. I think we all know that there is this industry is reliant on goodwill from the people who would invest in its future. We've heard an awful lot about future fuels. Martin, brilliant, thank you so much for clarifying for people because you do it much better than any of us. It's brilliant. I think it's undoubtedly the case that we'd like them to be able to invest in an industry which cares about health and safety. So to pass to you, Richard, please. The, the, the point I want to make here is that you know, I, I, I haven't quite got the longevity of Martin or, or you, I, I, but I have been covering the shipping industry for over 20 years. And in that 20 years, generally speaking, the hard-won improvements in safety, as a rule, have got better. Now, we are in a position now where 12% of the trading fleet are being covered by rules that we don't understand. They are, 69% uh, of the dark fleet has no known P&I coverage. W they are moving outside of the rules-based order upon which the basic safety standards of this industry, and let's be honest, they're not that great to start with, are being imposed. We have a bifurcation of trade within this industry. The large majority of it are still trading within a rules-based system. 
and going above and beyond and doing all of the decarbonization, jumping through EXI and CII and all that. We then have 12% of the fleet that is basically floating around the world with absolutely no oversight whatsoever. That is a serious risk that everybody needs to be aware about. And I just point to one thing, not in shipping, but the fact in 2022, we started this with you saying that sanctions aren't working. Actually, sanctions are having an impact. Uh, look at Russia's aviation industry, which of course, you know, we're often compared to aviation, but in 2022, the uh, International Civil Aviation Organization including that the majority of Russia's fleet of airlines were being starved of parts and were operating under maintenance that was decidedly unsafe. They had been red flagged. Now, if you translate that to shipping, that is the safety concerns. That is why this is an issue that we need to address. It is fundamentally a, an ecological disaster in the making. Thank you very much, Richard. Kevin has called us time out. I'd like to point out that we started late because some of your other people overran as well, so it's not just us, all right? But thank you very much indeed. Uh, Morton, <laughs> Frank, as ever, Russell, Richard, I think you've done a great job on this, and I hope it leads to a lot of debate. And I think the awareness of the subject is really important, as Richard has just said. Thank you.